All right, let's chat about something a bit chilling today. You know South Korea is famous for K-pop and K-drama, right? But there's another thing it's renowned for. Plastic surgery skills. Koreans are pretty focused on looks, sensitive about appearance, and plastic surgery is so widespread that it is no exaggeration to say everyone gets eyelid or nose jobs as a high school graduation gift. But here's the catch. Can we really believe that these surgeries are as simple and risk-free as we think? Apart from the inherent risks of surgery, did you know there is a surprising number of cases where people suddenly die after these procedures? Today, let's dive into what really goes on inside those operating rooms. We'll start with the Kwande medical death case. Back on September 9, 2016, a mother received a sudden call from her eldest son and rushed to a university hospital. The son who called her asked her to come to the third floor, which turned out to be the intensive care unit. And there, the eldest son revealed that his younger brother, Tae, was in the ICU, shocking her. The son, who had just said he was going to a friend's house, was now unconscious and lying in a hospital bed. Tehi, who had always been self-conscious about his jaw, faced bullying and trauma during his school years because of this complex. So to address his insecurities, Tehi secretly went to a plastic surgery clinic in Gangnam, hoping for a new look without telling his family. But 11 hours later, a call was made to transfer a bleeding patient to the university hospital. Tae was transferred there in critical condition. His heart was revived with CPR after cardiac arrest, but he didn't regain consciousness. So what exactly happened during those 11 hours at the plastic surgery clinic? With just two minutes of cardiac arrest, the university hospital told Tae's mother that he might not survive a week or could become vegetative. They even discussed organ donation, but his mother couldn't accept this. Tae was undergoing facial contouring surgery at a plastic surgery clinic that boasted 14 years without accidents. The director of the hospital who performed Tae's surgery visited the ICU the next morning he claimed that Tae was not in danger while at his clinic, and he suggested that the excessive bleeding was because of Tae's larger than average jawbone, but was not a serious issue. He even offered to provide the CCTV footage from the operating room if there were any doubts. So Tae's mother demanded all records related to her son. Unable to watch the footage herself, Tae's mother handed it to a relative who was knowledgeable in medicine and law. And after watching that video, the relative insisted that the video must be watched, even if reluctantly, as it contained all the answers. The seven hours and 13 minutes long video was intensely watched by Tae's mother, enduring all the pain. The surgery began with the hospital director entering the operation room. And about 20 minutes later, he started cutting Tae's jawbone. And from that moment, Tae's blood started dripping onto the floor. A nursing assistant nonchalantly wiped the blood with a mop, a scene that was repeated six times over an hour. An hour into the surgery, the hospital director left the room without even stitching up after cutting the bone. Soon, another person in surgical clothes appeared, not the hospital director or a nursing assistant, and this person began to stop the bleeding. He was a shadow doctor, or what we call a ghost doctor, someone who isn't recorded in the surgery records, but is there to perform the surgery on behalf of the real doctor. And this is totally illegal. Witnessing this, Tae's mother was unable to contain her outrage, in the CCTV footage, this ghost doctor continued with the rest of the surgery, and Tae's bleeding persisted. Another hour passed and the ghost doctor left. Then a nursing assistant 
not even wearing a surgical cap, continue to try to stop the bleeding. All this time, there were no doctors beside Tehi. Shortly after, the nursing assistant who had completed the stitching also left the room. Then, after changing clothes, the nursing assistant spent time beside Tehi, looking at her phone and applying lipstick. The hospital was essentially a so-called surgery factory. At the same time Tehi surgery was taking place, another patient was undergoing surgery in a different room. They were conducting simultaneous surgeries. An anesthesiologist would go from one operating room to another to administer anesthesia, followed by the hospital director performing the surgery. And once the director moved to the next operating room, the ghost doctor would come in to stitch up and clean the surgery site, completing the procedure. Three patients were undergoing simultaneous surgeries, and Tay was the second. The hospital staff, including the director, seemed to have no sense of wrongdoing in this practice. And when Tay arrived at the emergency room, he had lost about 3,500 cc of blood, which is equivalent to the total blood volume of a 45 kilogram woman. This meant that 70% of Tay's blood had been lost. But at the plastic surgery clinic, when Tay's blood pressure dropped because of the bleeding, the doctors administered a blood substitute. When his blood pressure temporarily recovered, everyone left for the day. Tay's condition worsened after he was moved to the recovery room. His blood pressure dropped drastically, leading to a 119 emergency services call. Tay urgently needed a blood transfusion, but no transfusion occurred before he was transferred to the university hospital. The hospital director claimed that we requested blood from the blood bank, but the 119 services arrived first, so we couldn't perform the transfusion. But this was false. Just four minutes before the arrival of the emergency services, blood for transfusion arrived at the clinic, but the medical staff did not proceed with the transfusion. Instead, they were seen laughing and chatting. Tay celebrated his birthday in the ICU 18 days after the incident. Despite doctors declaring his recovery unlikely, his mother never lost hope. On October 24th, the hospital director visited her and he persistently insisted that his clinic was not at fault and blamed the university hospital. He urged Tay's mother to sue the university hospital, and he claimed that in a criminal case, his clinic would undoubtedly win. And in the case of a settlement, since it wasn't entirely their fault, they couldn't accept full responsibility, making an ambiguous mix of threats and persuasion. Tay's mother, who was focused only on saving her son, was furious at the director's attitude, and she broke down, begging him not to make their situation harder. But the day after the director's visit, Tay's heart stopped beating. The medical staff predicted he wouldn't last the day, and his mother, in utter despair, decided to stop life-sustaining treatment and let her son pass away. Tay's mother, she tearfully shared, I think he left to spare me further pain after hearing me cry. Tay passed away 49 days after losing consciousness. His story eventually became known through the media. But the plastic surgery clinic, responsible for the medical accident, was still operating, advertising its accident-free record and falsely promoting that the hospital director personally performs all surgeries without any ghost doctors. In response to this tragedy, Tay's mother filed a lawsuit against the plastic surgery clinic's medical staff a month later. She devoted everything to the legal battle. Even though she was aware of the daunting task of proving medical negligence in a lawsuit, which is really hard, for her son, she had to read through complex medical records and expert opinions hundreds of times and watch the CCTV footage thousands of times, meticulously charting every minute and second. And armed with these detailed records and documents, she handed them over to the police. 
The police then forwarded the case to the prosecutors on charges of professional negligence resulting in death and violations of the medical law. A doctor's license can be revoked if they receive a prison sentence for violating this law, but the prosecution dismissed the charges of violating the medical law because of insufficient evidence. The involvement of a nursing assistant without a medical license and medical procedures clearly violated the law, but despite this, the prosecution did not acknowledge the violation. The mother, she couldn't stop there. She then sought evaluations from professional institutions, and six institutions provided 12 evaluations of confirming violations of the medical law. The police acknowledged this, but the prosecution still did not. And during this time, the mother discovered a distressing fact. The prosecutor handling the case and the clinic's lawyer were classmates from the same school and even attended the Judicial Research and Training Institute together. Her appeal to the higher prosecution was also rejected, but she did not give up. Since a case cannot proceed without an indictment, she filed a petition for a judicial review, hoping the court would order the prosecution to indict the suspects. The chance of such a petition being accepted was only about 0.3%, a slim hope, indeed. In desperation, she visited Tay's grave daily, praying and pleading with tears for his son to help her and she continued to stage solo protests every day. After 416 days of relentless solo protesting by the mother, the court finally ordered the prosecution to indict the suspects, and this was a miracle. It was a huge breakthrough against the 0.3% odds. In the subsequent first trial, the court acknowledged both the violation of the medical law and the charge of involuntary manslaughter. The judiciary did recognize the mother's pain, her harrowing efforts, but they sentenced only the hospital director to prison while imposing fines on the other doctors. Tay's mother was dissatisfied, so she appealed, and the following year, the appellate court imposed harsher sentences than the first trial. But this time, the medical staff, while acknowledging the facts, refused to accept their negligence and appeal the decision. So in January 2023, the Supreme Court made its final ruling, dismissing all appeals. This confirmed the sentences of the defendants. The operating doctor received a three-year prison sentence, and the rest of the medical staff received suspended sentences, leaving a sense of disappointment. This ended the mother's seven-year-long battle, but her mission was not yet complete. While sorting these belongings, she discovered this paper that had 20 bucket list wishes that was written by Tay when he was alive, and this included, leave a mark in the world with my name. Determined to fulfill this, she became the head of an organization, helping medical accident victims, and advocated for mandatory CCTV in operating rooms. Her relentless efforts led to the implementation of this law on September 25th, 2023. And this law was named Kwondehi Law, leaving her son's name in the world. The clinic involved is known to be a plastic surgery clinic located in Tamondong, Gangnam. There is a high possibility that this clinic would still be operating now under a different name. These plastic surgery clinics just changing their name after a major accident and continuing with their business is very common. So you have to be really careful when choosing plastic surgery clinics in Korea. And the important issue here that I would like to point out is that these so-called ghost surgeries are more prevalent in the Korean society than we might expect. In December 2013, a high school girl went to a clinic in Gangnam for a nose job after her college entrance exam, and she tragically died during the procedure. There were several dubious aspects to this case. Firstly, this clinic is a very well-known hospital. Located in Apgujongdong, known as the Mecca of plastic surgery, the clinic is quite large and would naturally employ many specialized plastic surgeons. But 
a death occurred during what is considered a relatively common surgery involving the eyes and nose. Further investigation revealed a disturbing pattern. Since 2008, there had been a consistent occurrence of patient deaths at this clinic. This wasn't the first death. Following this incident, an investigation into the clinic began, revealing this dark secret. This clinic practiced factory-style go surgeries. In a large room, several operating tables were set up with curtains separating them, and it resembled a wartime situation where many injured are treated simultaneously. Once the patients were put to sleep, they were laid on these tables and surgeries were conducted at the same time. The reason operating on multiple patients at once was, of course, more profitable than attending to one patient at a time. But the problem didn't stop there. The shocking revelation was that the operating doctor at the time was not a specialized plastic surgeon. The surgeons performing the operations were ENT specialists, not a plastic surgeon. Patients, of course, were unaware of this during consultations. Ultimately, the director of this clinic, Mr. Yu, was indicted without detention and went to trial. In 2018, the verdict was delivered a two-year prison sentence, and a fine of 3 million won. This case became a notable example, bringing public attention to the issue of ghost surgeries conducted by doctors. There have even been cases involving Chinese ghost doctors performing surgeries. According to a KBS investigation, a nursing assistant who worked at a major plastic surgery clinic in Gangnam, Seoul, reported seeing a Chinese doctor of Korean descent Chosonjok, which means ethnic Koreans from China, in the operating room. The nursing assistant recalled, the most shocking thing was that a Chosonjok Chinese doctor was performing the stitching in a breast surgery. When it was busy, except for inserting the breast implants and final design, the Chosonjok Chinese doctor did everything in the surgery. Even if this Chinese doctor had a medical license in China, of course, they are not permitted to perform surgeries in a Korean hospital's operating room. And simply holding a knife in a Korean operating room is illegal. Korean plastic surgery techniques are among the world's best and globally recognized. Many Korean plastic surgeons travel to China for temporary work under permits issued by China. It's said that when a famous Korean plastic surgeon is advertised in China, patients there line up in droves. Kwon Young Dae, a former executive director of the Korean Association of Plastic Surgeons, commented on this issue of Chinese ghost surgeries. He explained that some doctors in China almost function as disciples to Korean surgeons. When Korean doctors go to China, they receive permission and qualifications to practice there. And because it's impractical to always bring Korean doctors with them, Chinese doctors become very popular. They work with Chinese doctors instead. And conversely, it's beneficial for Chinese doctors to work with Korean specialists. If they lack skills, they are brought to Korea for training. And this is essential to bring them up to a certain standard, especially as many Chinese patients visit Korean hospitals. And here, ethnic Koreans from China are particularly valuable because they speak both Chinese and Korean. For a novice Chinese doctor working in a Korean, especially in a Gangnam plastic surgery clinic, is a valuable experience that benefits them later in China. So when asked about how they work in Korea, the experts said that they start by assisting in surgeries cutting whatever they need to, wiping blood, just basically helping out. And gradually, they start stitching and become more involved in the surgeries. This is illegal. This is definitely illegal. Have Chinese individuals in operating rooms disappeared? Quan said that they still exist. The numbers have reduced compared to the past, but the practice continues. And he said that there is still a huge market for it. Operating rooms are closed environments, making it extremely difficult to expose what happens inside. 
And even now, someone in a Gangnam plastic surgery clinic could be undergoing surgery at the hands of an unlicensed doctor. This serious issue is compounded by the difficulty in resolving and monitoring it. The problem becomes even more severe considering the number of people coming to Korea from abroad for plastic surgery. Many people travel from abroad, entrusting their well-being to surgeons in a foreign land, often with very little information about the actual qualifications of the people operating on them. This lack of transparency and difficulty in regulation not only poses risks to patient safety, but also potentially damages the reputation of legitimate and skilled medical professionals in the field. So, what are your thoughts? Maybe some of you can share your experiences with Korean clinics. I'll leave you with that for now, and thanks for watching. See you soon.